welcome to each of you who are joining our training today, which is focused on person-centered outcomes, uh, specifically uh, those that are used to assess progress for our participants in Free Through Recovery and Community Connect. Today, we'll take some time and navigate through the descriptions of each outcome and hopefully help uh, you to develop a person-centered approach as you are assessing these uh, each month during your reporting period. First thing that we'll look at today is the definition of what are outcomes. Outcomes identify a participant's progress towards or maintenance in the areas of housing, employment, recovery, and criminal justice involvement. One word that we highlight out of that definition is progress towards. There are many times that you may be assessing an outcome and although they have not arrived at uh, security or stability in that particular area, they are making progress and working on it diligently. And this may be enough for you to give them a yes or a positive outcome for that reporting period. Next, we'll look at what are person-centered outcomes. Person-centered outcomes indicate that every time we answer an outcome, we are considering that individual's unique circumstances and characteristics. This can be difficult at times because our tendency is to uh, want an answer that applies across the board to everyone. But those of you who have worked with individuals over time know that that can also work against us in truly assessing the needs, the barriers, uh, the goals, and the progress uh, for each participant that we are serving. Each individual is unique and housing situation for one uh, may differ from the housing situation from another, even though they both are living in a house or in a recovery center, whatever, we have to look at the uh, situation individually and consider uh, what may be affecting or what would be best for that participant. What is considered progress for one participant may not be for a different participant. An example of this is, if one participant is living in an unstable, unhealthy environment and then becomes housed at a supportive shelter that reporting period, the outcome in housing would likely be a yes. However, if a participant that was in stable supportive housing becomes placed in a shelter due to being evicted from their home that reporting period, the outcome would likely be a no in housing. So you can see in these situations that for one person, their trajectory is, is positive. They are moving towards more stable housing than they had before. So you may answer to yes. But for the other person, when you look at, ex they are both in the exact same type of shelter, but one, it's because uh, they've been evicted and their trajectory is going down. They are not stable as far as their housing situation. So this is what we mean by person-centered. We have to just consider the situation for each individual and uh, understand exactly what dynamics are coming into play. So here's some highlights about our expectations for outcomes each reporting period. Care coordinators will answer outcomes each month regarding each participant's progress in the outcome areas. And if the care coordinator does not have engagement with the participant during the reporting period, they are unable to answer the outcomes. And at that point, the care coordinator should be entering um, an outcome such as NA, uh, which would indicate that you were unable to assess, you did not have engagement. Now engagement is not just a quick contact, like a how you doing or a text or something like that. It's a conversation of some kind, either via video, it could be through other forms of media uh, or face-to-face -face where you were able to address areas of concern in their care plan, uh, areas uh, of outcomes, and also have enough interaction with the individual that you could discern uh, if they were stable and doing well, and um, if they are accurately reporting those outcomes to you. So that type of engagement is essential in order to be able to assess. Otherwise, the care coordinator uh, cannot uh, enter or assess outcomes for that reporting period. A care coordinator will begin the outcome entry process in DocStars for Free Through Recovery or the monthly outcomes document for Community Connect by answering the following questions. 
have you had engagement with a participant during this reporting period? And I just expounded on that, but I'll repeat it again here, that engagement is defined as a phone, virtual, or face-to-face -face connection in which the care plan or outcome areas were discussed. And exceptions to face-to-face -face engagement must follow the level of guidance. Chrono and case note documentation must support why face-to-face -face did not occur. There are a lot of different situations that could affect whether a face-to-face -face was ever able to occur. And granted, one of those that we all are experiencing currently is uh, COVID and how that may be affecting either the care coordinator or the participant. Uh, we can navigate through that and the other barriers that you may run into to engagement, but it needs to be documented uh, so that we can discern uh, that diligence uh, was applied by the care coordinator in attempting to engage. So let's look at the different areas of outcomes. A participant will receive a positive or a yes outcome if they demonstrate progress toward or maintenance of an identified outcome measure within the reporting period. Now, this is one of the essential things to look at. The reporting periods are different for each different program. Uh, Free to Recovery runs from the 21st of the month through the 20th, and Community Connect runs for the calendar month. So you must consider what is taking place during that actual reporting period. In the four areas that we assess, which you see here, housing, is the person living in a residence that's supportive of the recovery. Employment is a participant making progress towards or maintaining their employment and or their finances. This is a little bit of a change of how we used to look at employment because there are different situations where someone may be receiving some type of financial support that makes them financial stable, even though they are not employed full time. And this could still receive a positive outcome but you must assess, are their finances uh, adequate towards, uh, for what they need uh, to live a healthy, healthy life and to reach their goals. The third area that we look at here is recovery. Is the person demonstrating an effort to reduce their substance or the harm associated with their use and or improve their mental health functioning? Well, there's a lot included in this. It's more than just uh, whether they passed a test uh, to determine whether they were using uh, it can also be a uh, harm reduction approach, whether they are uh, reducing the amount or the severity of the type of substance that they're using. Also, we need to be looking at both sides of the picture here, not just the substance use, but the mental health. Uh, and what are some of the things that uh, they are doing uh, to reach their goals of maintaining health? One area, for instance, that this may have to be assessed is let's say that you're working with a participant who you've been serving for, let's say a year, and they have uh, been doing a great job as far as their sobriety for, for months and uh, have not had any reported use, have passed all of the tests that they've had to take to uh, verify that. And you've been giving them positive outcomes uh, for several months. Now, the next question might be, what type of pro-social supports are they developing that will continue to help them in their recovery and in their mental health? It's not just uh, about the substance use, which might be the main issue when they first come in, but what type of community supports and pro-social relationships are uh, we assisting that person in developing so that they can remain healthy and strong in their recovery journey? And or if they relapse or, or have a decline in their mental health, they have people, resources, community groups, so forth that they are surrounded with and can turn to. So this is one of the things that may help you when you're considering the recovery outcome. The fourth area that we'll look at here is criminal justice involvement. Is the person avoiding law enforcement involvement resulting in arrest, criminal charge, or a probation violation resulting in the initiation of revocation and the participant is reporting to their probation and parole officer as required by their supervision. There's a little bit of a change in the wording on this one. Uh, it's more than just uh, avoiding arrest or a criminal charge. They also need to be cooperating and meeting uh, the requirements of their probation and parole. We have had times where someone might uh, put in a yes for this outcome because there were no new charges, but then we noticed that the PO reports 
that the participant has not reported to them uh, this month or for a couple months. Uh, it is important that they are cooperating with their parole or probation officer as required by their supervision. Now, granted that this applies you know, mainly to our faith recovery participants, but uh, it may apply to some of the requirements for a uh, Community Connect participant as well. If you consider other professionals that they're involved with and are they working with these uh, to work towards help. So we expounded on these a little bit, but we'll take time to do just a quick review again. When we look at housing, is the person living in a residence that's supportive of the recovery? And the progress towards this will vary for each participant, as we've said. So we have to assess it on a person by person basis. Participant is considered housed if they're living in a place that best meets their needs and is safe and supportive of their recovery. There are some examples here, independent housing, living with family, friend, halfway house, et cetera. Now we've stated before, this isn't always black and white, but we must really assess on what best meets their needs and is safe and supportive of the recovery. One example that I've used at times is there could be one uh, couch that is a safe place and a supportive of recovery for someone where for another person having to sleep on that couch actually is unsafe in the fact that there may be unhealthy relationships there or uh, people that they're not allowed to be around because of their probation or parole or substance use or mental health uh, conditions that are going to not be supportive of their recovery. When we look at employment, uh, a Someone is considered employed or can have a yes outcome for employment if the participant is making progress towards or maintaining their employment and or finances. So I expounded on this a little bit, but we'll just look at a couple of these bullet points here where it says the participant is currently job seeking or taking steps to gain employment. Uh, the participant is employed or the participant can meet their needs from their economic resources or they're enrolled in work alternatives such as school, workforce training, unpaid work, internship, et cetera. So this is something that uh, must be considered uh, for each participant. Another example though, if we consider situations is, let's say you've been working with a participant for 12 months and early on in your uh, partnership with them, you were uh, helping and assisting them in filling out applications and now we're 12 months down the road and they still are telling you that they're filling out applications, but there doesn't seem to be any progress being made in this area. This may be something that you need to reconsider whether this can be a yes outcome this month or may need to be marked as a no. One of the best things to do though is to begin that conversation with the participant and ask some questions. Uh, what might be hindering that progress? Uh, is there some other areas of employment assistance that they may need help with, such as interviewing strategies and practice or, or uh, working on their resume or uh, maybe even addressing the way that they're filling out applications and, and how they're being honest with them, employers about their past and the way that they are uh, striving towards health and um, have great supports around them. These might be discussions that would be beneficial and helping that participant make progress. Recovery is that the person is demonstrating an effort to reduce their substance use or harm associated in their use and improve their mental health function. So let's just review a few of the considerations here. Are they refraining from using any non-prescribed mood altering substances that violate the terms of probation or parole? Uh, this would be one that uh, should be considered. And did they use substances However, there is evidence to support that they're engaging in strategies to avoid more serious problematic substances, or there's evidence that they are scaling back from the amount intensity of their use. Now, these are what would be, is what we call harm reduction strategies. But once again, that could change for a participant because in the first few months that you're working with them, you may give them a yes outcome because they're making progress uh, to reduce. But 12, 13, 14 months down the road, um, if they're continuing to use that, some of those substances, it may not be harm reduction at this point. But there may be additional conversation that needs to be had with you and your participant. We'll continue a little bit on some of the recovery considerations. Uh, first one here, the participant is honest with their provider and team about their use of substances and continues to work towards recovery. I really appreciate the approach that many of our 
POs uh, take too. There uh, sometimes there's this misconception or stereotype: the PO was out to get them and and to bust them if they confessed any, you know, use. Uh, our parole officers are doing a great job of acknowledging not only harm reduction strategies, but uh, helping our participants to really own whatever is going on and to be honest with their probation officers. So it's great to work together as a team to help our participants uh, take responsibility. Secondly, here's the participant making progress or maintaining their recovery. Uh, person can, why, this can widely vary from person to person because uh, we need to ask the question such as, is the person connected to pro-social relationships that support their recovery? This is what I elaborated on earlier, that maybe there hasn't been any use for several months, but they're still isolated. Uh, they still don't have some relationships that can uh, help them as they continue in their recovery journey. Last bullet point here we see is that the participant is demonstrating effort to improve mental health functioning and or reporting a decrease in symptoms. I wanna take a moment and just expound on that one. Uh, since we talk so much about substance use, uh, it can be easy to forget that there are about 15 to 20% of our participants who are in our program because of need for support around mental health and not substance use. Uh, granted, you know, the majority are co-occurring, but uh, we wanna make sure with your participants that we're not making that assumptions, nor are we minimizing uh, the severity of need that may be represented in their mental health functioning and the barriers or resources that we could pull around them to help overcome those barriers. A couple more bullet points here with recovery. Uh, the participant is seeking or participating in medicated, medication treatment and or mental health therapy. Uh, these would be considerations for a positive outcome. And the participant has initiated or is taking steps to seek supportive relationships such as peers, uh, or spiritual self-help resources, education, et cetera. All those are showing great signs of progress uh, in the life of that participant. If you have a participant that uh, you have been serving for several months, they have been receiving all positive outcomes and or maybe they're off supervision, then especially this last bullet point should be one that influences the conversations you're having and the goals that you're setting in their care plan. Are you starting to build uh, supportive relationships, peers, spiritual, self-help, that type of thing, so that this participant can continue to thrive in their recovery long after their PO is involved, their off supervision, or even your involvement? Are they uh, walking in a healthy way in recovery with the community supports uh, that you've worked together to put in place? Criminal justice involvement, I will expound on this one I already took a little bit of time on the definition here, but uh, I wanna look at some of these bullet points. Uh, if a participant is on probation or parole, they have had no violations resulting in revocation. So that's one of the considerations. Second one here, the participant has not been arrested for a new offense. Now, one of the things to keep in mind with this is uh, try to narrow that to that reporting period. Sometimes we'll have participants where they have a pending charge from the past, maybe three, four months ago. And it's not to their court date yet. So what you need to look at at this point is what has taken place during that reporting period. Now, this is one area that has changed under criminal justice involvement and under uh, in the process of assessing our outcomes. And that is outcomes while people are incarcerated. Um, care coordinator engagement with the participant while they're incarcerated is essential. So for a while, we used to have it that if someone was in jail or in prison, we would automatically put in the outcome of yes, no, yes, no for each, for all four of the areas. Uh, we have changed that. And one of the primary reasons for that is that uh, putting in an automatic outcome maybe gave the impression that it wasn't important to engage with the participant while they were in jail or incarcerated. Uh, or it made the assumption that those outcomes were either all yeses or all noes, and that there weren't factors that were contributing to their health while they were in a facility. But what we've really seen is that that time uh, of engagement with the participant is essential or critical. Uh, it's a time where you can not only be building rapport and relationship, uh, but they may have the time to talk with you. Uh, if you're running into barriers such as cost or fees for use of the media or video uh, resources that you're kind of county or state facility, you can use your communication gap funding and things like that to help overcome that barrier. 
But that time is essential, especially so that when they uh, transition out, uh, you have a plan. Uh, you have worked with them to uh, discuss such things as where they're going to live when they when they get out, uh, where they're going to work. Many times, some of the additional charges occur or relapse or, or whatever because the participant comes out and has nowhere to go but back to the unhealthy setting that they were in before. So we want to make sure that care coordinators are working not only to assess those outcomes but work on improving those outcomes. So I'll just use an example on that. Let's say that a person is in jail and you're addressing housing. Uh, a yes outcome for housing could be placed when you have arranged a place for them to go when they transition out. Maybe you've already helped obtain uh, a lease and they got the first month's rent ready or they're transitioning into a recovery house or whatever type of setting they're coming into. It, it is really the trajectory or where they're headed upon release. Is it going to be a setting that's supportive of their recovery? So. Those are the bullet points, or that's kind of elaborating and covered by the two bullet points here where it says care plan goals should reflect preparation for the participants released and each area of outcome should be assessed considering the participant's situation, a very person-centered approach. So if you have any questions on any of these, I would invite you to reach out either to myself uh, or any of our other FTR or Community Connect administrators. outcomes and you get your first uh, reporting period and it's time to start submitting those, uh, feel free to call one of our staff, one of our administrators, and we'd be glad to process it with you for the first couple uh, so you can kind of uh, get it under your feet and understand what we mean when we say person-centered outcomes. We appreciate all the work you do. We appreciate the work that it takes to assess these every month and to really work towards health and to work towards the goals that our participants are striving for and help them overcome their barriers. And we believe that this person-centered approach to outcomes is an essential part of that. So thank you for all you do and uh, keep up the great work that you're doing in your communities across our great state.